So you think you know what a rock is, but do you really? One simple definition might be that rocks are naturally occurring assemblages of minerals. No matter how much glue we mix in with a bunch of quartz fragments, no, that doesn't make it a sandstone. So let's sort these samples. Most folks would agree that these are rocks and these are not. But nature is never that simple. One of these rocks actually violates the definition we just gave, yet most geologists would still consider it a rock. Can you guess which one it is? Hint, it isn't actually made of minerals, but of organic matter. We'll come back to this. In fact, biology provides an interesting way to think about this deceptively simple question of what is a rock? And we're going to explore that today by comparing rocks to ecosystems. Welcome to another episode of Ozark Wonderings, our series of short FAQ-style videos giving brief answers to interesting questions about Ozark geology and more. In our previous video, we made the case that geological minerals are loosely analogous to biological species. Both represent the basic unit for classifying biological organisms or geological specimens. But now we're going to extend that idea by suggesting that rocks are analogous to ecosystems, considering some examples of ecosystems that are relevant to our home region, the Ozarks, and also some rocks you might find there. In the same way that an assemblage of individual species can form a more complex ecological community, an assemblage of individual minerals can form a more complex geological entity, a rock. The assemblages that occur together in nature aren't random. Certain combinations have a tendency to occur and others don't. Hickories are most likely in forests and woodlands. Oaks are more likely to extend beyond forests and woodlands into savannas. Deer can be almost anywhere. And starfish? Well, they don't belong in any of these. Let's toss that poor thing back toward the ocean where it belongs. Now consider the geological equivalent. There are similar expectations about what minerals should or might occur in certain rock types. Quartz is kind of like deer. It's common in a wide variety of rocks and can be present almost anywhere, especially in the Ozarks. Feldspar and mica are a little more restricted, expected in granite and rhyolite, possible in sandstone and shale, but very unlikely in limestone. Whereas calcite, the key component of limestone, could be a minor presence in sandstone or shale, but it's about as common in granite or rhyolite as a starfish in an Ozark forest. At this point, you might be wondering about a way in which this analogy really doesn't hold up. Your average specimen, say a deer, of a biological species looks like that species, deer, regardless of the ecosystem it lives in. But typical minerals making up typical rocks are different from the showy outliers that you can see in museums. Your average rock-forming mineral tends to be much smaller, and its diagnostic features tend to be a lot less obvious. For example, the quartz in this Missouri granite doesn't clearly show the hexagonal faces so characteristic of an independent quartz crystal. Unlike a species guide, whose imagery tends to look like the wild equivalent, you won't necessarily get very far using a mineral guide with showy pictures to identify tiny little everyday minerals in your average rock. And trying to identify rocks by field guide is just asking for trouble. It's kind of like trying to identify a forest type from an air photo. The explanation for this relates to how both minerals and rocks form. Definitely a topic for another day, but it's worth recognizing the difference. Some ecosystems are defined by their primary species composition, as in this map of forest types that distinguishes between oak hickory and oak pine forests. Similarly, some rocks are primarily defined by their mineral composition. For example, limestone is defined as being composed primarily of calcite, and the closely related dolostone is composed mostly of the mineral dolomite. The mineralogy is so important to this rock that the name of the mineral is even a common synonym for the rock itself. This is unfortunate because it's an understandable point of confusion for folks trying to understand the difference between a mineral and a rock. It's just a quirk of geologic phrasing that you can refer to dolostone as dolomite, but you can't refer to limestone as calcite. Thankfully, no biologists we know have taken to calling an entire expanse of pine woodlands just pine. But you might be wondering how well-defined these categories are. What happens if oaks, hickories, and pines all mingle in a location? And where exactly do you draw the line between a savanna and a woodland? Or a glade and a savanna? Aren't all of these categories just a little fuzzy at the edges? Well, yeah, but that's biology for you, always messy. Physical science is so much more orderly. 
Yeah, man. Categorizing rocks can be tricky too. In many cases, there can be a continuous gradient between different rock types. For example, the rock types sandstone, limestone, and shale aren't as distinct as they sound. There can be limey sandstones, sandy limestones, shaley limestones, sandy shales, and copious other intermediates. Maybe some of these messy classifications would be less of a problem if we grouped our ecosystems or rock types into broader, more general categories. Say, for example, we lump all ecosystems into simply terrestrial and aquatic categories. That seems pretty safe. But what do we do with floodplains, where fish can occasionally end up swimming around in the trees? Oh, carp. So while the basics of ecological classification are probably intuitive to any five-year-old, there's so much messiness around the edges that PhD ecologists have killed a lot of trees over the years debating which classification system best resolves these uncertainties. Sure enough, we have a similar problem for rocks. The most basic classification for rocks relates to their method of formation. Igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic. While these seem obviously different and these categories work well most of the time, it's possible to find examples where the boundaries aren't clear, even here in the Ozarks. This rock at Johnson Shut-Ins is composed of volcanic ash that was reworked and redeposited by water before hardening into rock. But this thin deposit is an oddity within a thick sequence of clearly volcanic rock. So is it igneous or sedimentary? And this rock at Hahn State Park has been a source of geologic debate over whether it's one of Missouri's only examples of metamorphic rock exposed at the surface or just more igneous rock. All of this complexity is just inherently part of humans trying to impose order on natural systems. On a different note, it's worth recognizing that the total number of species making up an ecosystem is much greater than the total number of minerals in a typical rock. But both rocks and ecosystems have some inconspicuous members casual observers likely won't notice, but are of great interest to specialists. For example, an unusual moss, such as this small and obscure knothole moss, might tell us something interesting about the ecosystem and the plant's dispersal mechanisms, related to sticky spores and visiting flies. In a geologic setting, mineral zircon is often tiny, less than a millimeter in size, way too small to pick out in a hand sample. But in a lab, these can be extracted from a variety of igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary rocks and used for radiometric dating that can tease out important details about the history of their host rocks. Of course, the rocks as ecosystems analogy breaks down if you stretch it too far. For example, there's more to the definition of a rock than a list of minerals in it. How the rock formed is also really important. Some granites can have major mineral compositions that are awfully similar to certain sandstones. But interlocking quartz crystals in a granite that crystallized from molten magma are fundamentally different from weathered quartz sand grains that were eroded, transported, deposited, and cemented together into a sandstone. There's no real biological equivalent to this. We've presented this analogy as a comparison between different realms, a biological one and a physical one. But we want to point out something else fun, that geology and biology are in fact rather intertwined. For example, Ozark Glade classification is actually based on bedrock type, because bedrock so strongly influences which plants can grow where. And in turn, the existence of some bedrock types is a direct result of past ecosystems. Remember that sample we showed at the beginning, which technically violates some definitions of a rock because it's made of organic material rather than minerals? That was coal, which fits anyone's functional definition of a rock, but really is composed primarily of compressed and altered plant material. You can find clear evidence of this in some places, like these samples from a central Missouri coal mine. And this rock sample is from bedrock composed almost entirely of crinoid fragments. These are actually relatives of starfish that likewise can only live in marine ecosystems. Crinoids and other marine organisms that form their body structures by precipitating calcite out of seawater directly contributed to a substantial portion of the Ozarks bedrock. Their presence is a major clue that the Ozarks were not always forested. And so here we have an ancient ecosystem contributing to the formation of bedrock, which hundreds of millions of years later is contributing to the formation of a modern ecosystem. Isn't that so cool? Can you think of other ways in which the rocks as ecosystems analogy is effective? Or maybe situations where it breaks down? Let us know in the comments.